In today's lecture, we will see IEEE 802.1D Spanning Tree Protocol. We will start the session with the outcomes. In today's session, we have four outcomes. Let's see what are they. Upon the completion of the session, the learner will be able to. Outcome number one, we will understand the need for redundancy and how failure is handled. Outcome number two, we will know about broadcast storm. Outcome number three, we will understand the spanning tree protocol. And the last outcome, we will understand various key concepts and the terms in spanning tree protocol. Let's start with the redundancy concept. Redundancy is always good because it enables the users to access network resources despite path description. Suppose if there is only one path between the sender and the receiver or between two nodes, then if that path fails, then obviously the sender will not be able to reach the receiver. And what's the main advantage of this redundancy? It improves reliability and it improves availability. In technology, two is one and one is none because a single connection means it is a single point of failure. And if that single point encounters failures and everything will become down. So creating redundant links is very simple and is always advisable. Because if we encounter some failures, we will be able to handle the situation perfectly. Let's see a scenario with redundancy. In this scenario, we have many ways to reach the internet. Suppose if this guy that is PC1 wants to reach internet, so it has this way, this way, this way to reach the internet. Similarly, it can take this way, this way and this way. Or it can take this way, this way, this way, this way and this way. We have multiple paths for PC1 to reach the internet. In case if this path fails and PC1 has another way to reach the internet that is this way, this, this and this. So redundancy is always good. But in a switching world, redundancy causes some serious drawbacks. Let's see what is that. In this case, there is no redundancy. Suppose if any device is connected to this port, if it wants to contact a device which is connected to this port, so this device will be sending the data to this port and this switch will take the data to this port and this switch will then forward the data to the destination. In case if this link fails, and obviously the sender will not be able to reach the receiver and that is why we are introducing a redundant link like this. And this is what a redundant link is. Suppose if this link fails, this switch can forward the data to this switch and this switch in turn will forward the data to this switch so that failures are handled. But this introduces a very serious drawback. Let's see what is that. Let's assume there is a device that is connected to this port. And if this device is sending a broadcast, obviously all the ports will be receiving this broadcast. So this switch will be forwarding this broadcast message on all the outgoing links except this port because this is the incoming port. Obviously this broadcast will be sent to this switch through this port and to this switch through this port. And let's name this broadcast message as B. So this message B will be sent on this port as well as this port. So this switch will be receiving through this port and this switch will be receiving through this port. And this switch is receiving a broadcast in this port and its job is to forward this on all outgoing links. So what it will do, it will be forwarding this broadcast message B on all the outgoing links. So obviously, this switch will also be receiving this copy of this broadcast. Now remember, already it has received a broadcast through this port. Now this switch is giving the same broadcast message through this port. So what it will do, it will send this broadcast through this link and this switch is receiving this broadcast in this port and this switch wants to broadcast this to all the outgoing ports except this port because this is the incoming port from this switch. So this switch will be forwarding this broadcast on all the outgoing ports including this port because this is the outgoing port. Obviously, this switch will also be receiving the same broadcast through this port. When it receives the broadcast message through this port, what it has to do? It has to send that on all the outgoing links. So this switch will be forwarding this. And what about this broadcast message? This switch already received one broadcast message through this switch. And what about the first broadcast message that was sent by this switch? So this has received the broadcast in this port and it will be sending the broadcast message through this port to the switch. And again, this switch is receiving a broadcast through this port. So what it has to do, it has to forward this on all outgoing ports. 
So at one fine point of time, the entire network will be full of broadcast messages. So this takes the whole network down. Because of this broadcast, the whole network will be down at some point of time. Because the entire network will be flooded with broadcast messages only. So the network will be down after some point of time. And that is what we call as the broadcast from. Because of this redundant link, there is a loop. And because of this loop, there is a broadcast from. We need to handle this situation. Though land redundancy is good, we need to handle this. Let's see it with an animation. Say this is the PC which is sending a broadcast message. So the switch is now broadcasting to all the ports except this port. And this broadcast is forwarded to all the ports. At one fine point of time, this broadcast is creating a storm in the network. And ultimately, it is going to take the entire network down. Because of this single broadcast message and there is a loop that is this is the actual loop. If you see this is the actual loop. So this single broadcast is ultimately taking down the entire network which we call as the broadcast term. Then how this is handled? So spanning tree protocol handles this situation very perfectly. Let's see how spanning tree protocol handles this situation. So PC1 is sending a broadcast. This switch is broadcasting this to all the outgoing ports. Though we have a redundant link here, it is temporarily blocked. And this switch is also broadcasting the same information. And obviously this switch is going to broadcast. But see the same message when it is received back to S1, it is dropped. Because this link is a temporary link. This link is a backup link. This backup link will be used only when the existing link goes down. So this is how spanning tree protocols handles this situation. So we need redundancy and we don't want this redundancy to cause some problems. And that is why we are going for spanning tree protocol where we have redundant links. But these redundant links will be used only when it is needed or to be precise. These redundant links will be made available only when the switch or the existing links encounter some failures. Let's see the key facts of spanning tree protocol. The key facts of spanning tree protocol include the original spanning tree protocol that is 802.1D was created to prevent loops. How it can prevent loops? Switches send probes into the network to discover loops. So what the switches will do periodically it will send a probe message in the network and these probe message will help to find out whether there is a loop or not because this loop only is going to take the entire network down. So we need to figure out is there any loop in the network. Suppose if this switch wants to send a broadcast message. So it sends the same message through this way and this way. Now this broadcast message will be forwarded to this switch through this way. And this broadcast message will be forwarded through this way. Say in other words, if this switch wants to check whether there is a loop or not, what this switch will do, it will send a probe message. And this probe message will be sent through this way. And this switch will forward this probe message to this way. And this switch will forward the same probe message through this way. When the switch receives its own probe message and it identifies there is a loop in the network. This is how switches finds out there is a loop in the network or not. How it discovers the loop? Because of this probe message. So these probe messages are called as BPDU. What is BPDU? It is Bridge Protocol Data Unit. Switches are going to periodically send the probe messages in the network. When switch receives its own probe message back, then it finds that or it discovers that there is a loop in the network. How switches identify that it is its own probe message? This BPDU will have specific information about the switch. So every switch when it sends a probe message, it will have its own unique identification in the BPDU. When the switch receives its own BPDU, it finds out that there is a loop. And the switch multicasts this BPDU probes every 2 seconds. And if it receives its own BPDU back, it means there is a loop in the network. Say if this switch is sending a BPDU, let's say this BPDU is with the name A. This A is received by this switch. This A is forwarded by this switch to this switch. And this switch is forwarding this A to this switch. Now this is the A that is created by this switch which is the BPDU. This switch is receiving its own BPDU back through this way. So it finds there is a loop in the network. Then spanning tree protocol comes into action and it blocks the redundant links. BPDU is not only going to discover the loops. 
Also, the BPDU probes helps to elect the root bridge. So, sparring tree protocol is going to work with the help of the root bridge concept. So, this election of root bridge is also done by BPDUs. And all switches will find the best way to reach the root bridge. In a network, one switch will be elected as the root bridge and all the switches will find the best way to reach the root bridge. And after it finds the best way, other paths are going to be blocked and the redundant links will be blocked because they are redundant links. So they will be used only when it is needed. How this best path or best way to the root bridge is decided? This is decided based on the port cost. We will be dealing about this port cost shortly. The best way to the root bridge is calculated through port cost. Then this redundant links will be active only if the existing links or ports goes down, which we have already seen. Let's now see the election process of the root bridge now. Suppose in this case there are three switches and these three switches are forming a loop. Just see this is forming a loop. And our STP that is the spanning tree protocol is going to remove the redundant link and it is going to be made as the backup link. So let's see how this is done. In order to do this, the root bridge must be elected. How this root bridge is elected? This is based on the BPDU. We have already seen in the previous point that BPDU is not only going to discover the loops, it is also helpful in electing the root bridge. This BPDU or the bridge ID, we will call this as the bridge ID. And this contains two important parts. One is the bridge priority, other one is the MAC address of the switch. When you explore this BPDU with the help of a packet sniffing tool like Wireshark, you will see that BPDU or the bridge ID will be having two parts. One is the bridge priority and the other one is the MAC address. Say, every switch will be having the default priority as 32768 and this is the MAC address part. So this is the actual BPDU or the bridge ID. So how this election is done? Which switch will be made as the root switch or root bridge? The switch with the lowest bridge ID will be made as the root bridge. In this case, everybody is having the bridge priority as 32768 and 32768. So there is a tie and it sees the MAC address part. Since this is having the lowest MAC address, so this switch will be made as the root bridge because this is having the lowest bridge ID. Now you may ask me a question, what is the need for having the same bridge priority for all the switches? Any switch manufacturer by default will use 32768 as the bridge priority if they follow the standards. It will be always a tie if the bridge priority is taken for electing the root bridge. Why this is done? Say in an existing corporate network, suppose if we purchase a new switch, obviously this new switch's MAC address will be bigger than the existing switches, right? The companies will do like that. The manufacturers will create the biggest MAC address in the recent days. The lower MAC addresses would be obviously manufactured in the earlier days. When a new switch is purchased for the corporate network, it will be having the bigger MAC address. But normally new switches will be with advanced features. So that should be made as the root bridge. Only then we'll be having better performance. What happens if a new switch is brought into the existing corporate network? So new switch will not be made as the root bridge. Why? Because it will be having the bigger MAC address. And that's why we will be given a privilege to change the bridge priority. We can change the bridge priority. We can lower the bridge priority value or increase the bridge priority value so that we can make the newly created bridge as the root bridge. So every switch will be finding the best way to this bridge that is the new switch. So this root bridge will have the lowest bridge ID. If there is a tie, the bridge with the lowest MAC address will be the root bridge. In this case, there is a tie if bridge priority is taken into account. When MAC address is taken into account, then this switch will be the root bridge and every other switches will be finding the path to reach this root bridge. Let's see the various port roles here. We know this is going to be the root bridge and we have root port, we have designated port, we have blocking or non-designated ports. We will see one by one now. What is a root port? Suppose we have a switch like this and if this switch wants to reach the root bridge, we know this is the root bridge and if this switch wants to reach this root bridge, how many ways there are there to reach it? This is one way and this is the other way to reach. Suppose if the link bandwidth is 100 Mbps. Let's assume in the entire scenario we use the link bandwidth as 100 Mbps. The default port cost for 100 Mbps link bandwidth is 1919. For this switch to reach this root bridge through this port, it uses the cost as 1919. 
And if the same switch wants to reach the root bridge through this way, it uses 19 plus 19, which is 38. So which is the smaller value? So it can reach the root bridge with the port cost of 19 through this way. So this will be made as the root port because this is the port which is used to take to the root bridge with the lowest port cost. So this will be made as the root port. When this is made as the root port and the opposite line that is this line will be made as the designated port. So per line there will be one root port and one designated port. If you observe here root port means it is used to reach the root bridge and designated port means it is also called as the forwarding port. So there will be one forwarding port per link. So in this link, if this is the root port and obviously this will be the designated port. So for this switch, in order to reach the root port, this will be 19, right? The port cost through this way will be 19. Through this way, it will be 19 plus 19, which is 38. So obviously for this switch to reach the root bridge through this port, it will be 19 only. So this will be the root port and obviously this will be the designated port. Only one designated port per link, so obviously this will be the designated port. So in this case, this line will be blocked because there is no need to use this line now because this is going to cause the loop. So obviously this is going to be the blocking or non-designated ports. So these are the various port roles available. Let's now see more about the spanning tree protocol. So we know spanning tree protocol ensures that there is only one logical path between all destinations on the network by intentionally blocking redundant paths that causes a loop. Suppose if this is the original network, so this spanning tree is going to close or blocks this path. And why? So spanning tree protocol is intentionally going to block this redundant path because this is causing a loop. And then a port is considered blocked when user data is prevented from entering or leaving that port. Data will not be forwarded through this port. But please note, BPDUs will be forwarded through this port because we need to figure out there is a loop or not. So this does not include bridge protocol data unit that is BPDU frames that are used by STP to prevent loops. So this path will be used for BPDUs to travel so that BPDUs are helpful to find out is there any loop or not? At the same time, these BPDUs are essential to elect the root bridge. And then, the physical path still exists to provide redundancy. This is also a physical path. So this physical path will be there, but it will not be active. So this physical path still exists to provide redundancy, but these paths are disabled to prevent the loops from occurring. Then when these physical paths are available, if the path is ever needed to compensate for a network cable or switch failure, STP recalculates the paths and unblocks the necessary ports to allow redundant paths to become active. Suppose if this port or this port is going down or this switch is encountering some failures or there is a cut in the cable. So what happens? This is the root bridge and this switch has to go this way to the root bridge. So what happens if there is a problem with this link or with this port or with this switch? So immediately STP recalculates the port cost and then this redundant link will be made available. So this redundant link will be used only there is a failure or problem with the existing link. So that's what I have mentioned. Suppose there is a problem with this link. So what happens? This redundant link will be made available so that this switch can reach the root bridge through this way. So our network will not be disrupted because of link failures and there is a loop and this loop is not going to create broadcast ROMs because our spanning tree protocol is going to save us from the broadcast ROMs. Before we conclude, let's see a homework question. And the question is, the root ports, designated ports and non-designated ports are depicted in the scenario. And the root bridge is also mentioned. We are required to analyze that whether the root ports, designated ports and the non-designated ports mentioned in the scenario are correct or incorrect. Please pause this video for a while, keenly analyze your answers and please type yes in the comment section if you find everything is perfect. Type no if you find something is not perfect. Just analyze whether the root ports, designated ports and non-designated ports mentioned in the scenario are perfect or not. And that's it guys. I hope now you understood the need for redundancy. We understood how failure is handled. We also know what is broadcast ROM. We also understood the spanning tree protocol and the various key concepts and terms in spanning tree. Like the port cost, the root bridge, the designated port, the root port, etc.
I hope you enjoyed the lecture and thank you for watching.